So in this lesson, we'll be discussing about breast cancer. So just a little bit of background, make sure to watch the video that has the anatomy and the structure of the breast, because that will best able you to understand, you know, where the cancer is when it talks about breast cancer. So on a whole, the general aspect of cancer is that it is a disease which some part of the body, the cell overgrows. Like in this area, you can see that you have the cells, the normal cells in an organized structural layer. But look at this tumorous, rapid growing, invading cell. It looks abnormal. It's not organized and structured. So this is what cancer is. So when we talk about breast cancer, it's the same concept that is taking place within the breast. So there are different types of cancer. We have the ductal carcinoma, then we have the invade, which is not that invasive. Then we have the invasive type of cancer, which are the infiltrating ductal carcinoma, the infiltrate lobulary carcinoma, the medullary carcinoma, the mucinous carcinoma, the tubular ductal carcinoma, the inflammatory carcinoma, and the Piaget disease. Now let's look and go into the stages. So this is stage one. In stage one, it is less than two centimeters, is not spread. Um, and in stage two, it is less than two centimeters, but the difference is that it goes into the lymph node, it metastasized, all right? In stage three, any size, but it has spread to the axillary lymph nodes area. And in stage four, it has spread to other organs such as the lung, the skin, the liver, the bones, and the brain. So make sure you know what's considered stage one, two, and three. So let's go into what the ductal carcinoma is. So in this area, it proliferates, is a proliferation of the malignant cell inside the milk duct. And again, it is not invasive. If it is left untreated, there is an increased likelihood that it progress to an invasive cancer. So the trend is to, you know, do less aggressive surgery and do breast conservative treatment. So for the infiltrate ductal carcinoma, this is one of the most common histological type of cancer and account for about 80% of all cases. So the tumor rise from the duct system and invade the surrounding tissue. So they often form a solid irregular mass in the breast. Hence, as a nurse, when you're doing your assessment, if there is a solid irregular mass, that should be called for suspicion. For the infiltrating lobular carcinoma, let's look. So here is the lobe. Here is the duct. So for this, you can see that it is intact in one place. But if you look in this area, you see that it is outside of the lobe and even in the duct. So the infiltrating lobulary carcinoma accounts for about 10 to 15% of the breast cancers. So the tumor arises from the lobular epithelium and typically occur as an area of ill-defined thickening in the breast. They're often multicentric and can be bilateral. Although most of the time, if you see a tumor or cancer, most of the time it is unilateral. For the mucinous carcinoma, this accounts for about 3% of breast cancers, and it often presents in postmenopausal women, 75 years and older. So a mucin producer, the tumor is also slow growing and the prognosis is favorable also in this type of cancer than in any other type. For the tubular ductal carcinoma, this accounts for about 2% of breast cancer. And because axillary metastasis are uncommon with this type of cancer, the prognosis is normally excellent. Now, then we have the inflammatory carcinoma. 
So with this, it is a rare type of cancer only occurring in about one to 3% of women. Aggressive type of cancer that has a unique symptoms. So even though it's rare, it is aggressive. The cancer is characterized by a diffuse edema, brownie, erythema of the skin, often referred to as perdurange. And keep in mind, this is actually a French word, perdurange. It, the perdu is actually skin and then the orange. So it's saying orange skin because it resembles like an orange peel. So inflammatory carcinoma can be confused sometimes with infection because of how it presents. So the disease can spread to other part of the body rapidly. Chemotherapy often play an initial role in controlling the disease progression, but radiation and surgery may also be helpful. Paget disease. So this um, disease of the breast account for about 2% of the prognosis case in breast cancer. Symptoms typically include scale, redness, itching, and even lesions of the nipple. So this disease often presents as DCIS of the nipple, but may also have an invasive component. Now, if no lump can be felt in the breast tissue, then the biopsy may show that it's a DCIS. Now, what is the DCIS? Remember, we talk about the ductal carcinoma in the institute. So with Piaget disease, it often represents DCIS, and DCIS is the first type of breast cancer that I spoke to you about, which is a ductal carcinoma in the institute. Um, so with this, if no lump can be felt in the breast tissue and the biopsy show DCIS without invasion, the prognosis is very favorable. So what are some of the risk factors? Female gender, 90% of the cases occur in women, although 1% um, men, 1% of men can have breast cancer. It increases with age. Age is associated risk factor for breast cancer if someone have a personal history of breast cancer. So once treated for breast cancer, the risk for developing breast cancer is the same or opposite breast is significantly increased, all right? So if they have a history already, they are at higher risk. So this is one of the part where I normally tell students, while female is at higher risk, while if their increased age put them at higher risk, but if they have a personal history of breast cancer, that put them at even higher risk, all right? So when you're doing a test, you may see which of the following is uh, at risk for breast cancer. You may, you may see all of them listed, but which one is at higher or higher risk? And that would be someone who had it already. In addition to that, genetic factor, BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation account for a majority of the inherited cases of breast cancer. Family history of breast cancer. So having a first degree relative with breast cancer, sister, mother, daughter, increases the risk twofold. Having two first degree relatives increases the risk fivefold. And the risk is higher if a relative was premenopausal at the same time of the diagnosis. So hormonal risk factors. So if someone had their period pretty early, individuals who had their period before 12 years old, if they had late menopause, that's after age 55. If they are a nulliparity, meaning never given birth. If they are late age at first full-term pregnancy, that's after age 35, that put them at risk. And hormone therapy, formerly referred to as hormone replacement therapy, put one at risk for breast cancer. So what are some of the protective steps that a patient can take? So research suggests that the efficacy of physical activity in the prevention of you know, breast cancer is good. Individuals who exercise or a reduction in the risk by 25 to 30% 30, 30, 30 of having breast cancer. The 30 to 60 minutes of exercise per day at a moderate intensity is regarded as optimal. Breastfeeding is thought to decrease risk because it prevents the return because it prevents the return of menstruation, thereby decreasing the exposure to endogenous estrogen, management of stress through the use of activities such as meditation and prayer, 
or involvement in support group may also be uh, protective measures too. So what are the clinical manifestations? So the breast, so breast cancer can occur anywhere in the breast, but it's usually found in the upper outer quadrant where most breast tissue is located. All right. And it is actually called in this area. That's why when you're doing the assessment, it's called the Taylor sweat sweat should also be assessed, but it is normally found in the outer upper quadrant, which is this area. So the lesions are non-tender, they're fixed rather than mobile. They're hard with irregular borders. So when you're doing this, uh, the breast assessment, you want to check if they are non-tender, if they are fixed, if they have a hard with irregular borders. So complaints of diffuse breast pain and tenderness with menstruation are usually associated with benign breast disease. So surgical management. So they will have modified radical mastectomy. The modified radical mastectomy is performed to treat invasive breast cancer. So the procedure involves removing the breast tissue, including the nipple, the areola complex. So in addition, portion of the axillary lymph nodes will also be removed. All right, and this is called axillary lymph node dissection. And you will see this acronym ALND throughout the presentation. So in modified radical mastectomy, the pectoralist major and the pectoralis minor muscle are left intact, meaning that they're not removed. Unlike radical, radical mastectomy in which the muscles are removed, all right? So again, when in modified radical mastectomy, you have the pectoralis major, the pectoralis minor muscle, they're left intact. But when you have the radical those two muscles are removed from the chest. So total mastectomy. So like modified radical mastectomy, total mastectomy, which is called simple mastectomy, also involve the removal of the breast, the nipple, the areola complex, but does not include the, axil the axillary lymph nodes dissection. So total mastectomy may be preferred in patients with non-invasive breast cancer, which does not have a tendency to spread to the lymph nodes. So it may be performed prophylactically in patients who are at high risk for breast cancer, meaning that they have the BRCA genes, BRCA1 or BRCA2. So breast conservation treatment. So the goal of breast conversation treatment, which is also called lumpectomy, wide excision, partial or segmental mastectomy is to remove the tumor in the breast completely and obtain clear margin while achieving an acceptable cosmetic result. So if you look at the picture, so this is a tumor and you can see they go a little bit wider than the tumor to capture some normal breast tissue in it too, to make sure that none is remaining in the area. So if the procedure has been performed to treat a non-invasive cancer, lymph node removal is not necessary. So for an invasive breast cancer, lymph node removal plus the axillary lymph nodes will be taken out. Lymph nodes are removed through the aspiration of the semicircular incision in the axilla. Radiation therapy. So radiation therapy is used to decrease the chance of local reoccurrence in the breast by eradicating residual microscopic cancer cell that cannot be seen during surgery. So both conservation treatment followed by radiation therapy for stage one and stage two breast cancer revive, results in a survival rate equal to that of the modified radical mastectomy. If a radiation therapy, which is a part of the breast conservation treatment, is contraindicated, a mastectomy would then be indicated. So with the radiation, they have an external beam radiation, which is the most common type. Typically begins about six weeks after the breast conservation to allow the surgical site to heal. If a systemic chemotherapy is indicated, 
radiation treatment usually begins after it's complete. So that means if they're getting radiation and chemo, they will get the chemo first and then the radiation after. So before radiation begins, the patient undergoes a planning session called a simulation in which that part of the body, the breast area to be treated are mapped out and then identified with a small permanent ink mark. So the external beam radiation, what it will do, it will deliver a high energy photons in administered to the entire breast region, the whole breast radiation. So each treatment lasts only a few minutes and is generally given five, given five days a week. So each treatment lasts only five minutes and is generally given five days a week for five to six weeks. So after completion of the radiation to the entire breast, many patients receive a boost, a dose of radiation where the cancer cells were located. So the boost consists of the same dose of the radiation, but is in less penetration and direct to the small area. Again, the treatment is not painful, but what happens when you have a radiation to the side sometimes is that it's just like having sunlight burning on the skin. So the first couple of treatments may not be painful, but as time goes on near to the six week, the site may get dry, may burn, may feel a little bit of discomfort to the area. So nursing management for someone who's re receiving radiation. So the nurse plays a significant role in supporting the patient through this kind of treatment. So self-care instruction for the patient receiving radiation is of paramount, especially when it comes on to the skin integrity during the treatment. So they're pertinent only to the area where treatment is received and not necessarily the entire body. So remember earlier, and I told you that because it's like, you know, sunlight beam into that area, they may have dryness of the skin. And even in some cases, some people, depending on the skin type, sometimes the skin even open. So using mild soap with minimal rub into the area, avoid any kind of perfume soap or deodorant. Use a hydrophilic lotion such as Eucerin or Aquaphor for dryness. Use a non-drying antipyretic soap such as Aveeno if itching occurs. Avoid any kind of tight clothes, underwire bra, excessive temperature, and even any kind of ultraviolet light, including we're talking about sunlight to the area. So chemotherapy. And remember, chemotherapy will be given first and then radiation afterwards. So chemotherapy is most commonly initiated after breast surgery and before radiation. So chemotherapy regimen for breast cancer combines several agents, um, which are called polychemotherapy, and is administered over a period of three to six months. Now, what is the nursing management for someone who is receiving chemotherapy? Instruct the patient about the use of antimetic agent and to re review the optimal doses scheduled to help them minimize nausea and vomiting because one of the side effects of chemotherapy is nausea and vomiting. So the patient will be advised, they will be prescribed some antimetic, such as our Zofran. In addition, they could even get Regalin. So all of this, you know, any of those that the doctor may prescribe should be given 30 minutes before the initiation of the chemotherapy to prevent nausea and vomiting. Measures to ease the symptom of even mucositis may include rinsing with the mouth with normal saline or sodium bicarbonate solution and avoid any kind of hot spicy food and use a soft toothbrush. So remember that it is systemic. So the chemo may damage normal flora in the body. So the normal protective mechanism may not be there. So what they will have is thrust or mucositis. So when we talk about food, even black pepper, that doesn't bother the normal person and maybe they can't even, the normal person may not, or a person who is not receiving chemotherapy may not even be able to tell that the food has black pepper inside there. For the person with mucositis, the black pepper will affect them. So some patient may require hemopoietic growth factor to minimize the effect of chemotherapy induced neutropenia and even anemia. So to prevent some form of emotional trauma that's associated with alopecia, it, is often help, it often helps to have a patient obtain a wig before the hair loss begin. So the nurse may provide a list of wig supplier in the patient geographical area. Get familiar with creative way to use scarf and turbans may also help to minimize a patient distress. 
The patient needs reassuring that new hair will grow back when treatment is complete, although the color and the texture may differ. Now, I know one of the things um, nursing students are told, never reassure the patient anything. Here's the difference between this reassurance and others. You know, it is scientific, it's given, the hair will grow back. But you can't guarantee the person that, or reassure the person that you're going to be fine. You can't reassure them they're going to be fine because you don't know. But evidence and science have shown us that the hair will grow back. So yes, you can tell the patient that the hair will grow back, but the texture and the color will be different. So chemo may negatively affect the patient's esteem, sexuality, and even a sense of well-being. So when it comes on to sexuality, they have um, sex therapists. If they need to talk to a psychologist, a referral can be made. Uh, the nurse can put something in the system to say this person to see the sex, um, the sex therapist or to see the psychiatrist or psychologist. Providing support and promoting open communication are important aspects of the nursing care. Referring the patient to the dietitian, social worker, psychiatrist, spiritual advisor can provide additional support. So there are numerous kind of community support and advocacy groups that are available. The nurse should have this information to share with the patient too. Complementary therapies such as guided imagery, meditation, relaxation, exercises can also be used in conjunction with the conventional treatment. So let's look at some complications secondary to treatment. Now, because of the surgery that they may have removing the breast, they are at risk for having lymphedema. So once lymphedema occur, it tends to be chronic. So preventing it is the best strategy. So after the axillary lymph node dissection, the patient is taught hand and arm care to prevent injury or trauma to the affected extremity, thus decreasing the likelihood of developing lymphedema. And we're going to talk about some of those exercises in a different slide. The patient should be instructed to call the healthcare provider immediately if they suspect that they're having any kind of lymphedema. Treatment may consist of course of antibiotic agent if they suspect that there's infection, a referral to the rehabilitation specialist, which is occupational or physical therapist, may be necessary for a compression sleeve or gloves and to even teach them some exercises or do manual lymph drainage. So in addition to the lymphedema, they may have hematoma formation may occur. So hematoma formation, this is actually a collection of blood inside a cavity, and it may occur after a mastectomy or a breast conservation and usually develop within the first 12 hours after surgery. So the nurse assesses for signs and symptoms of hematoma at the surgical site which may include swelling, tightness, pain, and bruising of the skin. So the, the surgeon should be notified immediately if there's a gross swelling or increased bloody output from the drainage. Depending on the surgeon's assessment, a compression wrap may be applied to the incision for approximately 12 hours, or the patient may be returned to the operating room so that incision may be reopened and identify the source of the bleeding. So the patient may take warm shower or apply a warm compress to help decrease, sorry, to help increase the absorption. A hematoma usually resolve, resolve in about four to five weeks. So another complication is seroma formation. The seroma formation is a collection of serous fluid which may accumulate under the breast incision after a mastectomy or a breast conservation. So signs and symptoms include swelling, heaviness, discomfort, and a slugging of fluid. Seroma may develop temporarily after the drain is, is removed or if the drain is in place and become obstructed. Because remember, after the mastectomy, they will put a, a drainage system in. So if it become obstructed or even sometime after removal, that's when the seroma may develop. So this kind of formation, seroma formation is rare, but pose a threat and may be treated by unclogging the drain or manually aspirating the flu with a needle and syringe. So large long-standing seromas that have not been aspirated may lead to infection. Hence, one complication of, a, of treatment for breast cancer is infection. So although infection is rare, it is a risk 
after any surgical procedure. So this risk may be higher in patients with conditions such as diabetes, immune disorder, and advanced age, as well as those with poor hygiene. So patients are taught to monitor for signs and symptoms of infection, redness, warmth around the incision site, tenderness, foul smell is drainage, temperature greater than 40 degrees Celsius or 100.4 Fahrenheit, and even chills. And in addition, they need to contact the surgeon or nurse for evaluation. So treatment consists of oral or IV antibiotic for more severe infections for about one to two weeks. So culture are taken of any foul smelling drainage and been tested to see what microorganism causes the infection. So let's look at some of these exercises, a mastectomy. One, the first one is a wall climbing. So the patient should stand facing the wall with feet apart and toes as close to the wall as possible. With the elbow slightly bent, place the palm of the hand on the wall at the shoulder level. So by flexing the finger, work the hand up the wall until the arms are fully extended. Then reverse the procedure, working the hands down to the starting point. And this is called wall climbing. The next procedure, this is a rope turning. So tie a, a light rope on a doorknob, stand facing the door, take the free end of the rope in the hand on the side of the surgery, place the other hand on the hip with the rope holding arm extend and held away from the body, nearly parallel to the door, turn the knot, the rope, making a wide swing, as possible, begin slowly at first and then speed up later on. So again, with the rope holding arm extended and held away from the body, turn the rope, making as wide a swing as possible, begin slowly at first and speed up later on. Another one is a rod or broomstick lifting. So in this, they will grasp a broomstick or a rod. It is held about two feet uh, apart. Keep the arms straight, raise the rod over the head and bend the helper, lowering the rod behind the head. Reverse the maneuver, raising the rod above the head and then returning it to the starting position. And this, these exercises are good for patient who had had a mastectomy. So another exercise is called the pulley, pulley tugging. So toss a light rope over the shower curtain rod or doorway curtain rod. Stand as close to the rope as possible. Grasp an end in each hand. Extend the arm straight and away from the body. Pull the left arm up by tugging down with the right arm, then the right arm up and the left arm down. So this is called the pulley tugging. So let's look at nursing management for patients with breast cancer. So you wanna make sure, as we mentioned, that before the person do the exercise, that they get pain medication 30 minutes before they begin. In addition to that, they can take a warm shower before exercise. It can loosen up any kind of stiff muscle and provide some form of comfort. When exercising, the patient is encouraged to use muscles in both arms and to maintain proper posture. Specific exercises may be needed to, may need to be prescribed and introduced gradually if the patient has a skin graft. So with a skin graft, the skin that is used for grafting at the breast could be taped from the abdomen, it could be taken from the back. Self-care activities such as brushing, brushing teeth, washing face, brushing hair, are physical and emotional therapeutic because they actually aid in restoring arm function and provide a sense of normalcy for the patient. So the patient should be advised, generally heavy lifting, more than five to 10 pounds is avoided for about four to six weeks. So normal household work related to activities are promoted to maintain muscle tone, brisk walking, the use of stationary bikes, steps, machines, stretching, exercise may begin as soon as the patient feels comfortable. Once the drain is removed, the patient may begin to drive. If the patient has a full arm range of motion and has no longer, no longer taken opioids. So the general guideline for acting, activity focus on gradual introduction of previous activities, such as bowling, weight training, once 
the patient surgical site is fully healed. So for patients who are receiving any kind of surgical procedure, especially when you talk about the lumpectomy, they may get some isotope, radioisotope that is blue. So as a nurse, you should tell the patient that they may notice a bluish greenish color in the urine or stool for the first 24 hour has the blue dyes excreted. The incident, as we mentioned for lymphedema, decreased the arm mobility and seroma formation. The nurse must not overlook psychosocial needs of the patient and the nurse must listen and provide emotional support and refer the patient to the appropriate specialist when indicated. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please feel free to make any comments below. Thank you.